As we continue in our walk through the book of Psalms, we come to Psalm 131. And as we read it, let us cry out to the Lord with the psalmist this morning. Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. We thank God together for his word that is given unto us. Willie and Nelda Browning were a little older couple that sat a few pews in front of us at the First Baptist Church in Lyford, where I grew up. Willie and Nelda were probably about 175 years old, I think, at the time. And one Sunday, in the middle of the service, Willie turned to Nelda and loudly said to her, it is not me. Now, I think you need a little context in order to understand that outburst. And you have to know that sitting just a few pews behind them was my family, and my little brother Andrew was sound asleep and snoring in my mother's lap. Willie's comment to his wife that was heard by the entire congregation came because she thought it was him that was snoring and kept elbowing him throughout the service. A child's safe place of warmth and rest caused an older man to get elbowed in the ribs repeatedly by his wife and to cry out in his own self-defense. Now, in defense of, of Nelda, I think she had spent a large part of their married life Sleep, sitting next to a snoring man in church. And so he was innocent that day, but there were other days where he was indeed the culprit. Now, I'll never forget that Sunday, and I think about it when I read this psalm because of this great image of a weaned child with its mother. There's something about that picture of a child asleep in her mother's arms that speaks to us this morning about the childlike faith of worship that defines this psalm of praise that we read together today. The second night that we opened our warming station this winter, I, I had planned on staying there overnight so that I could oversee every shift change and kind of get an idea of how the whole thing was going to work with one set of volunteers coming in and another going out several times over the night. And it was our first opportunity to house a family, so I just made that decision. I was just going to sleep or, or stay the night at the church. My family came up for a few hours as we were opening the station, and then they went on home because we were opening the station on a school night, and so they went home to get some rest, and it was such a blessing if you got to be here and see this family from the community come in, and those of us that got to go to their home and saw just how cold it was inside their home, realized, I think, just how many things we so often take for granted in, in most of our homes. And then getting the family here and, and seeing them light up as they shared a warm meal. There's just something about watching children eat and knowing that they're really hungry, the way they eat, that was so humbling. And then watching the mom of the family just kind of come to life and begin to relax and interact with Erica Mata and the other ladies from our church who were there and once this family warmed up for a little while, they decided that they, they wanted to go back home because the dad didn't get off work until midnight, and mom was very much with child, and she knew that if he got home and she wasn't there and all the family was gone, they would assume, of course, that she had gone to the hospital. And so we gave them a ride home and, and took them pillows and blankets, and, and that meant that all of us got to go home a lot earlier than expected. Now, I arrived home to the beautiful sight of my lovely wife asleep on the couch with all the kids camped out all around her on the couches and chairs and on sleeping bags on the floor. It was such a beautiful sight of them having their own warming station snuggled up together 
in the den of our home around our heater. Such a Norman Rockwell-type moment to see them sleeping peacefully gathered around their mama. There's just something about the peace and contentment that being close to a beloved mother can bring. And the psalmist wants us to know that as we worship the Lord and learn to serve him with childlike faith, he fills our hearts with that kind of peaceful contentment and confident trust. Psalm 131 is one of the 15 songs of ascent that we find in this section of the book of Psalms. And that means that it was part of a collection of worship songs that pilgrims would sing as they made the literal ascent up Mount Zion to go and worship the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. And the word picture of this psalm is of a weaned child content simply to be in its mother's arms. It's not hard to imagine the psalmist thinking of children that he had seen carried up that mountain with the the parents carrying the child as they go together to worship the Lord in the temple as a family. And any of us who have watched a mother soothe a fussy toddler can appreciate this wonderful image. We envy, I think, the contentment of a child with his mother. Wouldn't it be great to be able to put aside our pride, to be able to curb our ambition, to be able to truly follow Jesus' instructions to let not our hearts be troubled? to realize the inner serenity that is pictured in this beautiful song of praise. And that's exactly the kind of contentment that this psalm invites us to experience. It draws us toward a spirit of worship that centers on the goodness of God. This song invites us to live in trust in the reliability of God throughout all the seasons of life. The psalmist testifies to the peacefulness of trusting God and invites all of us to share in that experience of resting in God's providence and goodness. The song is a prayer of total trust. The arrogant rely on themselves and refuse to submit to God, but the true believer is as dependent on God as a little child with his parents. Jesus echoed the heart of this song of praise in the New Testament when he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How would our lives of worship be impacted if this worshipful image came off the pages of this psalm and became the reality of our experience? How would our day-to-day lives of faith be different if we truly learned to rest in the presence of God as a weaned child rests in the arms of her mother? I don't know about you, but I feel drawn to this psalm, not because of how much it describes my normal experience, but because of how much it, it doesn't. I long for the kind of trust, contentment, and serenity that these verses describe. And so many of our days are defined by anything other than that. When the psalmist says that his heart is not lifted up, that his eyes are not raised too high, that he's not dwelling on things that are beyond his understanding, but that he's calmed and quieted his soul, we get the idea that things have not always been like that for him. You don't have to calm and quiet a soul that's already calm and quiet. Vaulting ambition, pride, and meddling in affairs beyond his ability and comprehension had once shaped and defined his life, but now he has found peace. He's found a way to replace restlessness and needless anxiety with calm and quietness. Like a child being carried to a worship festival by his mother, the psalmist now rests in the hope that he's being carried through life by the Lord, resting in the hands of his creator. The psalmist wants 
was like a needy newborn, but now like a weaned child, he is able to rest in the contentment that comes from just being with God. And I'm struck as I read this psalm by how much more our prayers tend to resemble the cries of a newborn than the restfulness of a weaned child. We cry out to God in prayer and say, God, give me this. God, I need this. God, here are my problems. Here are my struggles. Here are seven things I would like solved by noon today. And that's okay. God tells us to share the desires of our heart with him. We can cry out to God. If we've learned anything from this psalm study, we've learned that we can take everything that we are, everything that we think, everything that we feel, and, and, and take it to the Lord in prayer. And yet, what a great prayerful example we have here in Psalm 131 of of a prayer that says not so much, God, I need this from you, but God, I just want to be with you. Let me sit with you. Let me rest with you. That figure of the weaned child has kind of two parts to it. There's a figure here of giving up something and a figure here of finding something. There is something given up and then there's the discovery of contentment. The child gave up the mother's breast and in doing so learned contentment and security without it. And in this maturing process, the psalmist turned away from his own ambitions and learned to wait on God. Erica said the other day in one of our staff meetings when talking about this psalm that he learned how to let go and let God. And that's a simple but difficult concept for many of us to master. I think we would agree in principle that we need to foster the spirit that is described in this psalm of praise, but then we leave here and very quickly in practice we get right back to our lives that are defined so much by ambition and pride and scrambling for what we want and so little by security and contentment in the presence of God. Pastor Kent Carlson says that setting aside ambition is the necessary groundwork for any significant spiritual change in our lives. In our world that is so defined by what kind of house you live in, what kind of car you drive, what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of title you have at work, how much people respect you or what they think about you or what they say about you, Carlson says that we're just not going to grow spiritually unless we learn to lay aside that ambition. He says, the desire to be better than others, the odious nature of comparison, and the lack of contentment with our actual state is the problem formationally. On the one hand, ambition is a robust muscular virtue. It's the driving force behind many good and noble endeavors. It's how bridges get built. It's how improvements are made in our society. And Carlson says he realizes that Most of the people he's ever respected in his life are people that are very ambitious. And yet, he says, on the other hand, it doesn't take much reflection to observe that ambition is often fueled by the insatiable desire to be recognized as important. So much of our ambition, if we're being really honest, is about what other people think of us, what other people say about us. What, other peop- what impression other people will have of us when they see our Facebook page or, or whatever. And he says, my experience tells me that personal ambition is a ravenous monster not easily tamed. It is something we must find a way to control. Unbridled ambition is common and it comes naturally to us, but it keeps us from living with the childlike faith of worship that is required if we are going to live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, it comforts me to think that the psalmist who wrote this psalm developed this discipline over time. I like that he says, I have calmed my spirit. I have quieted my soul. I I like that there was a time in his life that wasn't calm and that wasn't quiet because it makes me feel better about my own struggle. The disciplined life of quiet submission didn't come any more naturally to him as it does to us. Crying for milk is natural to a newborn, but maturity enables a child to be content in its mother's arms. Ambitious fretting and worrying about things that are beyond our control are as natural to many of us as breathing. 
But the psalmist reminds us in this prayerful psalm that it is possible for humility and patience to replace selfish struggling. But how do we develop that discipline? How do we get to the point in our life where we can say no to self so that we can say yes to God? How do we learn to turn our backs on our me first ambitious side so that we can truly begin to live a life of quiet submission and simple obedience? How do we do what Erica said so artfully that many of us have already uploaded that to Facebook? How do we let go and let God? How do we learn to live a life that is nurtured by the childlike faith of worship? I think verse 3 gives us a clue as we begin to wrestle through those questions. In the spirit of resignation and contentment, the psalmist concludes by calling God's people to wait patiently for the further development of God's purposes. O Israel, he says, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. If there were only two verses to this psalm, I think we would leave here admiring the faith of the psalmist. I think we would leave here saying, boy, isn't that great that somebody somewhere was able to lift their eyes, not too high and not focus on things that are beyond him, and was able to rest contently in God's presence? That's great. But then we get to verse 3, and we begin to be challenged and inspired to make that experience our own. To say, I need to hope in the Lord. To say, I need to not worry so much about the things that are beyond my control. To say, I need to learn what it is to rest in the presence of God like a weaned child. Now you might be thinking, that's all well and good for somebody who wrote this song thousands of years ago without t-ball games to take his kids to and bills to pay. But I've got stuff to do. I've got concerns. I've got burdens. I have struggles to overcome. I live in the real world where I can't just abandon my worries and sit around like a weaned child and trust in some God that I can't even see. And yet it's that very act of continuing to worship relentlessly in the real world full of worry and strife that helps prepare us for the new world that is dawning before us where we will continue to worship and serve God in the kingdom that is unfolding right now as God is making all things new. There's something about the spiritual disciplines of worship prayer, study, fellowship, and Sabbath that pull us away from the hustle and bustle of normal life and remind us that we really can live a life that is defined by trust and hope in the Lord no matter what trials come our way. Commentator Robert Davidson says, those caught up in the feverish restlessness which features in so much modern life and the pursuit of personal achievement, no matter the cost, would do well to ponder this psalm that ends with an appeal to the congregation, to the whole people of God, to relive this experience, to fix all our expectations on the Lord. And that, he says, and that alone is the secret to security and serenity, which will carry us through all that life may bring now and in the future. As we let this psalm have a home in our hearts, as we begin to confess to God the ways in which sometimes we focus on things that are only his control, as we begin to cry out to God for the ability to rest in his presence like a weaned child, as we begin to seek the kind of hope that is required to endure in the long run through this life, we begin to grow in the childlike faith of worship that is pleasing to our Father in heaven. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, which I think is a great name. If we have another son, I think we will name him Reinhold Niebuhr Parker. I love that. But he wrote a prayer that has been widely circulated, and it was modified by Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs, and it's become a, a very effective, prayerful tool that has helped <coughs> different people struggling with different issues begin to pray through those with this childlike faith of worship. The prayer says, God, 
Give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is and not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. I texted and I called several of our farmers over the course of the last few weeks to let them know that I've been praying for them. Rain is almost always a welcome thing when you live on a farm because there never seems to be enough of it when you need it. It's impossible to grow things without water. We tried for many years on our family farm to grow things without water, and you just cannot do it. And yet there are times such as planting season and harvest time when you need hot and dry weather to get done what you need to do. And if you've been watching the weather at all, not, and I don't mean the weather on television, I mean if you've been noticing what's going on outside, and if you're familiar at all with the agricultural season we find ourselves in here in the valley, you know that we have had the exact opposite conditions that are needed in order to get crops in the ground. It's been cold and it's been wet, and that makes it impossible to plant seed. One of the farmers that I called the other day said this, I used to worry a lot about the rain, and at some point I figured that I can't make it rain, and I can't make it stop raining. So I might as well trust God in the middle of it. I was so impressed by that statement of faith. And I'm, I'm sure that that farmer, like all of us, has good days where that kind of faithfulness comes naturally and bad days where it's a little harder to trust God in the middle of the struggle. But I think that statement of prayerful faith is a great place to start. And it sounds a lot like a modified version of the prayer that we read in Psalm 131 today. God, I wouldn't begin to know how to make it rain or stop raining for that matter, so I'll leave that kind of stuff in your hands. And I'll settle down like a child with his mama and trust you to handle the things that are beyond my reach. Come to think of it, I'll encourage all your people to hope in you forever. Now, we may not know anything at all about farming, but I think we can appreciate that feeling of what it's like to grapple with faithfulness in the midst of circumstances that are simply beyond our control. Stewing on this prayer where we find the childlike faith of worship, I think, is a good place to begin preparing for days like that. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I don't do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, First Baptist Church, Weslaco, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And all of God's people said, amen. This morning, we're going to sing a song of invitation. And as we prepare to do that, I, I want to extend an invitation to everybody that's here today. Maybe it, as we've read through this psalm of total trust and contentment, you find yourself longing for something like that. Maybe you had a great relationship with your parents. Maybe you didn't. Maybe the idea of a weaned child with its mother is just something that's kind of foreign to you. But it sounds awfully nice to think about the creator of the universe having a special place in his arms for you. And this morning, you want to be able to enter into that kind of relationship of trust and dependence and submission where, where you can know what it means to say, God, I, it's yours. Do with my life as you will as long as I get to be with you. This morning, I invite you to come and to know the peace that passes all understanding that can only come through a relationship with God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, His Son. I invite you to come and experience that for yourself.
Maybe today you're a believer. There's some struggle in your life that you just need to pray through. As you reach for trust and contentment and serenity in the midst of the chaos, you just need somebody to pray with you, somebody to encourage you. I invite you to come. Maybe there's something you need to lay aside, some ambition, some burden that you've been carrying for too long, and you just need need to surrender it. I invite you to come. And we'll pray through that together. Maybe today you would come and make this your church home, where together we seek to serve the Lord with childlike faith and to invite others to do the same. You respond to God, however he leads your heart as we stand and we sing together.